22nd, 2018 meeting of the Oshkosh Common Council. Welcome to all in council chambers as well as those watching or listening on Oshkosh Media. Would the city clerk please take the roll? Herman? Here. Ellis Nosby? Here. Homeri? Here. Mugrower? Here. Crozy? Here. Pat? Here. Cummings? Here. Present? Seven. Would you all please stand while Councilmember Herman leads us in invocation, followed by the Pledge of Allegiance. We are mindful of the blessings of liberty that we have in this nation. May our decisions tonight improve the quality of our life in our city and for our citizens. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. You all sit, please. Except you guys. <laughs> you want to turn around? We have a certificate of appreciation for leaders and the Pledge of Allegiance. So, if you want to turn around and face the camera, and I'm going to ask all of you just one. Qu you want to step back a little bit? Okay. I'll ask you all just one question: your name your age, where you go to school, and what you look forward to doing this summer, which is almost here. Uh, yeah. My name is Max Carlin. I go to South Park. I'm 14 years old, and I'm looking forward to baseball this summer. Great. And you must be his sister. My name is Sophie Carlin. I'm in fifth grade. I go to Lakeside, and I'm looking forward to softball this summer. Ooh, both of you like baseball in the same family. Slide down. I'm Sophia Olmstead, I'm 11 years old. I go to Lakeside Elementary and I'm looking forward to tubing this summer. Okay. I'm Zoe Olmstead, I go to South Park, I'm 13 and I'm looking forward to sailing. Oh, well my son sails, I think you know him. He, he's at Lakeside after school. Adam, Adam. yeah. Zoe? Now you two can go home and, and tube and sail or uh, baseball, or you can uh, stay here and watch local government in action. <laughs> the, do the door's that way. <laughs> they moved out quickly. Uh, next, we have an, an introduction of a new battalion chief, Chief Franz. Would you like to introduce uh, Michael? Uh, and while you're walking up here, uh, this is T Ch uh, T Chief Franz's last council meeting as he's retiring shortly. So uh, you're, you're smiling, though. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So thank you. Uh, this is Mike Rudder. He is our newest battalion chief. He replaces John Fenrick, who uh, uh, battalion chief who just retired um, April 30th after 30 years or 29 years of service with the city. So, um, as I said, Mike will be uh, replacing John as battalion chief. So he will be in charge of one of the shifts. In addition to that, his other position is uh, taking care of logistics for his administrative duties, and that is equipment and station and facilities repairs, things like that. So, um, look forward to having Mike on board. He's doing a great job. We're been training with him here for the last few weeks, and, and uh, next week he'll be out there on a shift on his own and um, taking care of business. Well, he's pretty much doing that today, so I'm just keeping an eye on him. So, um, as speaking of, said John retired, and as you said, Mayor, um, this will be my last time addressing the council in my official capacity. So, I just want to thank you, and I want to thank the city for the opportunity that I had. To serve everybody all these years, it's uh, I could not have asked for a better job and a better place to do it, and all the support that the council and, and everyone here in the city has given me. So I'm going to stay here and, and enjoy my life here. But I appreciate everything every everyone's done. I'm I'm going to miss it, but I'm looking forward to retirement. So, thank, thank you, Chief. Thank you for everything. Thank you, Chief. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. 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 Thank
Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Long time no see, Mike. <laughs> Thanks, Tim. Yeah, Battalion Chief uh, Rudder may come back since he got a standing ovation. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, next on the agenda, we have the annual presentation of the 2018 Acanthus Historic Preservation Awards. And members of the Oshkosh Landmarks Commission are here to make the presentations along with me. Uh, with Shirley Brenner Maddox come forward, Paul Arnold, and Harold Buchholz. And I will meet you over there. Thank you, Mayor, uh, for the opportunity to present um, recognizing um, members of our community who have preserved our history. And it's not just for this generation, for the next. The first award is for Artie and Ed's Drive-In, and that would be Artie and Steve Davis. Artie and Ed's Drive-In, as the business is known today, began in 1948 as the South Side A&W Drive-In, serving little more than A&W root beer, hot dogs, and potato chips. In the late 1940s, it was one of only several drive-in restaurants in Oshkosh. One of the early owners, Mr. and Mrs. Nate Rohr, eventually owned a number of root beer stands in the Fox Valley. In 1953, the business was purchased and operated by Robert and Elizabeth Ollie Albrecht of La Crosse. On July 1st, 1960, the business was sold to Mrs. Albrecht's son, Edward Tim, and his wife, Ardeth. The Tims operated the business as the Southside and W Drive-In until 1972, when they decided to operate it as an independent drive-in, renaming it Artie and Ed's Drive-In. They have continued serving the famous draft root beer and great food as they have in the past, and roller skating waitresses still take your order. After the death of Ed Tim in 1979, Artie continued operating the business. Today she runs the business with her partner and husband, Steve Davis, who began working there in 1977. Steve has been honored by the Wisconsin Restaurant Association in both 2008 and 2010 for excellence. Artie and Ed's is an iconic remnant of the 1950s and 60s. Between 1957 and 1964, the Oshkosh City Directories list over 15 different drive-in restaurants. However, McDonald's began in 1960 on Jackson Street, changing forever the options that Americans have for eating away from home. Artie and Ed's is host of the monthly summer cruise in night, attracting owners from across Wisconsin with classic cars from the 50s, 60s, and 70s. It gives patrons an opportunity to gather and relive a few moments in another era across from the beautiful shores of Lake Winnebago and enjoy a draft root beer float. Thank you for the memories, Artie and Steve. Thank you, Shirley. Would Artie and Steve, Steve Davis please come forward for the uh, certificate? And I'll try to read this while holding a mic. Um, the, the City of Oshkosh and the Landmarks Commission are pleased to recognize the contributions of Artie and Steve Davis for special achievement for the longevity and cultural significance of Artie and Ed's and the maintenance of the architectural features of the drive-in built in 1948, presented this 22nd day of May, 2018. Steve, would you like to say a few words? Well, I'd like to uh, say thanks to uh, the Landmarks Commission for honoring us with this. I mean, we, you know, when you go to work in that little building every day, you don't always think of it as a is a landmark or a icon, but uh, especially over uh, the last few weeks, we've come to realize how much uh, the people of Oshkosh think of us, and that's really special. And so I'd, I'd like to just say thanks uh, for the award, but also thanks for uh, supporting us for the last 70 years, and uh, hopefully we can uh, keep doing the things you like. Thank you. The next 
Acanthus Award is to Bonnie Marusik for the Idison Osborne House, 1304 Algoma Boulevard. The Idison Osborne House, described in the Enterprise of 1898 as one of the most elaborate houses in Oshkosh, was designed by William Waters, an architect capable of designing in many styles. This three-story Queen Anne-style home has a Romanesque stone arch entry, and shingle style is reflected on the second and third stories. A portion of the original Dutch colonial carriage house, also by Waters, was converted to, to a garage in 1908. Victorian rooms have um, with specific purposes, a reception room with a cozy corner to sit and wait, a, re a receiving room for guests, complete with an annunciator and a ladies' parlor, a billiards room in the basement. But the magnificent barrel-vaulted two-story music courting room is the focal point of the main floor. There is an upper balcony with great acoustics where musicians played while guests danced below and chaperones observed the young couples. The once painted wood in this room has been stripped to reveal the natural beauty of rare sycamore. The room is graced with built-in seating by the front windows, an arched window with Moorish accents also reflected in the ceiling light, a set of beautiful pocket doors at the entrance to the room, and a fireplace from a 1620s English castle, thought to be installed by the Osbournes. The original wall coverings were bur a painted burlap, and they have been restored. Originally, the house had both gas and electric lighting. Many of these original fixtures are preserved and still in use. A magnificent staircase leads to the second floor with a dramatic view down to the first level. The story is that an interior designer convinced Mrs. Osborne that all the woodwork and light fixtures in the upstairs should be painted gray. Bonnie and Howard painstakingly stripped everything to reveal the beautiful wood and brass light fixtures. The owners, 120 years this house is, four owners. Allison Baptist Idison, original owner, was secretary of the Payne Lumber Company and mayor of Oshkosh from 1897 to 1899. And those of you that know your history, as mayor, during the infamous woodworkers' strike of 1898, he responded to the unrest by calling in the National Guard to restore order, which made him unpopular. The Idisons moved to Ohio a few years after his term as mayor. Philbert and uh, um, Alice Osborne and their sons Chandler and Robert lived here from 1904. Albert was a wealthy lumberman owning many lumber companies. He bought a small island in 1905 in Lake Winnebago where he hunted ducks, keeping a journal for 32 years, which served as a source for research on waterfall in Wisconsin. His son Robert, who's on the photo right now, um, attended U UW and graduated from Yale where he studied art and also in Paris and Rome. As a satiric cartoonist, artist, satirist, and author, he is renowned for his many books and drawings. He enlisted in World War II as a Navy pilot, but he did not qualify. Using his artistic talent, he created hundreds of drawings uh, for flying planes with the bumbling character Dilbert, the pilot, and Grandpa Pettibone. Lieutenant Commander Robert Osborne was awarded the U.S. Navy Legion of Merit in 1946. His autobiography, Osborne on Osborne, describes and illustrates his early life in Oshkosh. His caricature of a lumberman hangs in the house today. Alice and um, Albert Osborne, his parents, are buried in Riverside Cemetery. Attorney Robert and Annette Thompson lived in this fabulous house for almost 40 years. But the final people today, Howard and Bonnie Marusek, are the fourth family to occupy the home, having bought it from the Thompsons in 1980. Although they were looking for a new home, Bonnie instantly felt that this 
was the house. The exterior was painted and they have repainted and maintained it. Each room in the house was exquisitely restored to the late Victorian period using historic reproduction Bradbury and Bradbury and William Morris wallpapers. There are eight different woods, including butternut, curly popular and sycamore, that used throughout the house, which was all stripped of paint and restored to their natural beauty. Original picture rails, telephone box, ice box, and annunciator all remain. Pawnee researched photographs, Victorian books, paint experts, and restoration experts to decide on colors, materials, and designs, which included plaster embellished decorations. Bonnie, her late husband Howard, and their daughters lived in, cared for, restored, and maintained every inch of this wonderful William Waters home and the extensive social and political history it contains. It was never their intention to make the home a museum, but to preserve its history for future generations. As a house meant to be lived in, the three daughters were all married in the house, all in different rooms. Today, the grandchildren enjoy playing in the many spaces this grand house has to offer. Thank you, Bonnie for preserving a wonderful historic home. Thank you, Shirley. But I have, I have a certificate, uh, an award for you. Would you like me to come over there? It'll be easier for you. I'll meet you halfway. This is the Acanthus Award by the City of Oshkosh and the Oshkosh Landmarks Commission. We're pleased to recognize the contribution of Bonnie Morosek for the interior and exterior restoration and preservation of their home at 1304 Algoma Boulevard, uh, built originally by the Edison and Osborne family. So thank you very much. Would you like to say a few words? I know it's a labor of love and the whole home is spectacular. It was on Howard's part, on Howard's part as well, um, both of us. the time period that it was in. So, and our, my neighbors are the ones that I think encouraged this to happen, the, the, the Acanthus Award. So thank you, neighbors, and thank you, Shirley and Carol, for all of the work that you put into this. Sometimes economics are part of historic preservation, and this is the next story. The Paternal Reserve Association Building, 1914, now called Washington Place. Randy Schmiedel and Mike Goudreau. The Paternal Reserve Association Building is a four-story office building designed by prominent Oshkosh architect Henry Oler, former partner of William Waters. Completed in 1914, this is the most intact example of a Georgian revival style building in the city. It exhibits classical elements including tripartite composition, red brick facade, a flat roof, pedimented door surround, a colonnade of pilasters with Doric limestone capitals and bases, a symmetrical facade, and large arched windows. The Fraternal Reserve, incorporated in 1902 as one of Wisconsin's largest fraternal benefit societies and the only national headquarters located in Oshkosh. The reserve grew so rapidly throughout the Midwest that they began construction of a new headquarters in 1913, choosing Henry Uller as architect and C.R. Myers and Sons as the builders. The first and second floors were rentals for businesses. Many were rented before the building was completed. Oler ensured that everything on all the floors will be of the best from an artistic and utilitarian standpoint. The floors on the corridors are mosaic, and the main stair is marble, as are the wainscoting on both the first and second floors. 
The fourth floor was a double height main hall to, a, to conduct lodge events. In fact, the first year it was open, they held the state convention there. In the mid 1950s, a fifth floor was created by infilling the two story fourth floor. By 1930, the, the Fraternal Reserve insurance had sold so well with $17.5 million net worth, they merged to become Equitable Reserve Association and moved to Nina. Mm -hmm. Partners Randy and Mike purchased the 100-year-old building in 2014. They hired McGrosty Historic Advisors of Chicago to guide them through this project, applied for National Register of Historic Places. This qualified them for tax credits to create and um, to convert a historic office building into 20 apartments while maintaining its historic integrity. The cost of the 1914 building was estimated at between 50 and $60,000. Randy and Mike took on a $4 million project, including remediating an area for garages. Working with the city and state and utilizing historic experts, they have provided a market for those who appreciate living in a unique apartment with historic elements and enjoy living in the central city with easy access to the waterfront and bike trails. Just as the Fraternal Reserve Building played an important role in the economic and social development of the city 100 years ago, so Washington Place continues to contribute to the vitality of Oshkosh today. Thank you, Shirley. Randy and Mike, you wanna come on down? That sounds like a game show, come on down. <laughs> and this Acanthus Award is to Randy Schmiedel and Mike Goudreau for the preservation and adaptive reuse of a Georgian revival building which is located now in the neo neoclassical historic district of Oshkosh. Gentlemen. Just want to say thank you to Shirley and the Landmarks Commission for nominating us. This is a great honor. I also want to take a moment to thank some of our partners with the project. It was an exhilarating project, challenging project, but also a fun project. So a big thank you to Susan Hirschberg, uh, Dennis Reedinger from RH Design Build. They were instrumental with this project, helping us with construction management and a lot of the design features that we see in the building today. Also a big thank you to the City of Oshkosh and the Inspection Department as this project uh, was not meant to be altered, so it was very challenging, and they uh, provided a lot of guidance for us, so thank you to them. Also a huge thanks to the Council. Without their support, this project most likely would have not happened, so thank you to all of you. you like his hand in <laughs> It's fitting as we approach Memorial Day for the next award. This is for the Oshkosh High West Veterans Honor Hall, Andrew Schaller, teacher. Men and women from Oshkosh from its earliest history have served in the defense of our country and have been duly honored. 100 years ago, the city of Oshkosh built several arches, including the Victory Arch over Main Street to welcome home the troops. In 1919, a series of plaques honoring those who lost their lives in the Great War were installed on the building at the corner of High and Main Street. Opera House Square, Riverside Cemetery, Menominee Park, Red Arrow Park, and throughout Oshkosh are monuments honoring those who served in the military. Today, however, we recognize a modern landmark, the Oshkosh High West Veterans Honor Hall with engraved nameplates of former Oshkosh High School and West High School students who served or are presently serving in the military. 
In 2017, Andrew Schaller, social studies teacher and Iraqi war veteran, and his students researched names, contacted families, utilized resources at the Oshkosh Public Library, and sought the help of local veterans organizations to search for veterans who were former students. Our teachers and their students painted a mixed media mural on the wall where the engraved name plates of veterans are now attached, listing their rank, name, graduation day, branch of service, and date of service. The oldest name goes back to 1883. Andrew Schaller and students will continue updating the list of honored names with over 2,500 names at present. It is fitting in 2018 as we celebrate Memorial Day and the world celebrates the centennial of the end of World War I that we recognize a teacher who created a project fostering an interest in our history by gathering the names and stories of those who served and to create the only one of its kind, a Veterans Honor Hall located in a high school. It serves as a daily lesson to those students who pass through this hall to acknowledge those who served to preserve their rights and freedom. This is a lesson well taught. Thank you, Shirley. Andrew? Ms. Canthers and Waters for Andrew Scheller, the students at Oshkosh West, formerly Oshkosh High School. Uh, I had the honor of uh, part participating in the uh, dedication ceremony as both mayor, but importantly a graduate of Oshkosh High and a veteran. You know, this project has been uh, one of the most humble things I could have ever done. Uh, every day I get to speak and meet with veterans around the community um, or family members and hear the stories. And the names that are up on this, in the honor hall, the 2,500 so far, and I'm going to add another 100 next week, uh, we're looking at World War I now, um, are, are a constant reminder that these people are more than names. They have pictures. They have, they have faces. They had lives. We need to know their histories. Um, it, it really has been a project trying to hunt people down. We do not have access to the veterans' records. We need family members to help out, uh, community members to help in that. So I, I do have to thank uh, my administrator for allowing me to go through with the project. Uh, of course, the art department uh, and my wife. And, and, I, and I, I say that because I got over 1,100 hours invested in this. Um, and 1,100 hours uh, well deserved for everything the veterans have done for the community. And my wife always jokes that we go to bed at night, I have the honor hall on my computer in my lap, and she's watching Jimmy Fallon. <laughs> uh, so that's her date. Uh, but I, I greatly appreciate it. Uh, the, it's well, over, well overdue. The veterans deserve every bit of recognition they get, and we'll continue to do our best to, to add more every day. So thank you. Thank you. I have to apologize for getting a bit choked up, but it's a rather impressive uh, thing to see. And I'm of the Vietnam era. Many of my, I knew many people who did not come back from Vietnam. Uh, you know, good friends. Um, and it's, uh, if you have not seen the wall, um, you, you should make a special appointment to go see it at Oshkosh West High School. So again, thank you, Andrew, your students, the school district, everyone involved. And thank you, Landmark Commission members. I'm also a member of the Landmark Commission, so. All right, next we have citizen statements to council. And uh, Pam, did anyone sign up to speak? I have no one registered. Okay, thank you. Next we'll, did you wish to speak? Yeah, I registered this morning, so I could. Are you Bonnie Cook? Yes, I have you registered for item number 27. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next, we'll move to consent agenda. These items are those items of routine minis mini administrative nature that are voted on by the council in a single roll call vote. Staff recommends approval of all items. 
Any member of the public or common council may request an item to be removed from the consent <coughs> agenda for discussion. Pam, did anyone register to speak to any of these items? I have no one registered. All right. Uh, well, that'll bring it back to the council for a motion and a second. So moved. Second. second. Discussion? Councilman Herman. Thank you, Mayor. Um, reference resolution 18-281, I just have a couple comments and maybe um, Mr. Ravi can answer a question or so. Um, first, I guess I wanna, I've been critical of AECOM, so I wanna at least give them some credit this time around for the peers taking on a rather extensive look at uh, the project at uh, South Park and there were some challenges apparently with the company that the city of Oshkosh had uh, contracted with and uh, AECOM had to step in and uh, apparently take on quite a bit more. <clears throat> my, my question is, the company is Michaels, right? Correct. Um, are they gonna get put on our naughty list so we don't contract with them anymore? Uh, they are not currently pre-qualified to do any work um, in the city for 2018. Um, obviously the contract that they had from 2017, um, they're allowed to finish. Um, and I have been uh, working with the city attorney's office to uh, make sure that um, we have appropriate documentation so that uh, should they request pre-qualification, we have enough documentation to go back to them and say, you know what guys, um, th this project didn't work, let's, let's step back and think about this okay. a little more. Okay, and then my second question is, I know AECOM listed a bunch of things that they did on behalf of this contract to get it back on task. My question is, none of those were in the original contract with AECOM to do, or was this oversight and then they saw that they had to uh, step in? I know they had task one up on budgeted engineering and project management, but weren't they the project manager anyways on the project? Yes, they were. It's just the uh, the significant level of effort due to some of the challenges with the contractor were not something that we'd experienced on any other project. So that it, you know, some of that additional effort was not something we'd anticipated because generally the uh, the things go a little smoother with the okay. contractor. Okay. All right. Um, yeah, like you said, I guess it, it is significant. It's one hundred sixty-two thousand plus, but um, it sounds like. Um, they got it back on track and we'll get the project done and uh, we'll have some um, protections in place. And then, um, I don't know if anybody else has any questions on that one. I do. Okay, go ahead. That's no, go, go, go back. I'll wave. Oh, go, go ahead. ahead. Mr. Mr. Muguro. 281. Go ahead, yep. Mr. Muguro. Still on 281. Um, basically, just one question. I do see you note uh, public staff, public work staff will pursue recovery of these additional costs or possible recovery. I guess what protections are built into our contracts that provide for those possible recoveries. As Liquidated well as what's damages. A, what's our level of, um, how comfortable or, or how confident are we in our recovery uh, of, there, of some of those funds? Yeah, there, there are standard terms in the contract as referred to liquidated damages. Um, if they fail to meet uh, certain uh, scheduled completion dates, whether that be substantial or final completion, and we're also reviewing some of the language for some of the milestone dates that were in the contract as well. Um, so then that would be a reduction in the, the amount that's owed to them and that generally um, as we're, if we're reviewing any uh, potential change orders, that's when that goes, all right guys, you know, here's, here's you know, the amount of liquidated damages, so that's gonna reduce the contract by this amount. So um, once the project is done, then we'll be able to assess all of those uh, potential liquidated damages and work through that process with them. Good, thank you, that's all I have on that. Right. I had one question on resolution 18275, and I believe and I, my request was that we have a photo of the rendering of the, the building for the citizens to see. Is that? Yeah. <clears throat> I guess we don't have it. Jake. Does, Scott, do you have it? Uh, resolution 18-275. Your miles can move on. It's amazing what you can do with a building originally built to manufacture carriages. OK, 
Okay, thank you. Um, Council Member Peck. Back to 281. Um, Mr. Robbie, uh, would it be safe to say that AECOM's tribal knowledge of how the city operates in many of these projects actually allowed them to step in and do the job that they did? Yes. So that sometimes it's very it, it's beneficial to the city to have that tribal knowledge, so to speak, of working with the city over a period of years and understanding the many things that are involved in this. Yes, yeah, certainly in a, a case like this with this uh, project, it was very helpful. Okay. And probably I would assume if we had to go and is, is had we bid this out, it would have number one probably cost more and number two delayed the project significantly. Is that correct? Potentially. I, I, I can't say for certain, but it's certainly that there is a potential for that. Okay, thank you. Uh, just quickly, we've come, uh, we're showing uh, some colored renderings of the building uh, former carriage works. Yeah, I think these are the ones you were looking for. That's what I was looking for, yeah. But it's uh, it's just showing the, the really the rebirth of what we're calling now the Sawdust District and, uh, you know, just some very creative architectural uh, work on a very old, very old building. Deputy Mayor Palmieri. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, back to 281. So, um, Mr. Rabbi, um, in the AECOM memo that came out, it did say that they were anticipating some challenges um, based on some of the circumstances, but they also noted, uh, I guess, you know, that there was an anticipation of 90% of the project being completed in 2017, but currently it's at about 60 percent completion is that still accurate um, at, at the time they wrote this that that was certainly the case there has been work that has been progressing uh, since then um, so it is certainly beyond that 60 percent at this point in time um, but and when when they developed their anticipated schedule they certainly expected a lot more work to have been done last fall um, you know at, at this point I know they just finished the the clay liner on the uh, East Lagoon so they can uh, start getting uh, all of the lagoons, you know, finished now, and start getting a lot of that restoration work done. Um, so they're certainly above the 60% that was originally uh, per um, reported in their uh, document. Um, I think one of the things they had originally started writing this a little sooner than a few weeks ago, and uh, that number may not have gotten updated when it was the final version was issued after I'd had a chance to review it. So then, would you say we're at? 70, 80 percent, any guesstimates? I, I would estimate, yeah, 75 to 80 percent complete at this point. Thank you. Council Member Herman. Thank you, Mayor. I know we're bouncing back and forth, but um, you can put back uh, resolution 18 275. I guess, Mr. Roloff, the question I have is this is in our new uh, district also for tax incentives, correct? Or not? We're not specifically offering any tax incentives through this program but mr. Davis might be familiar with some of the programs that they may be trying to take advantage of through the state perhaps well what was that project that we got approval with go ADC and we designated an area and was part of the sawdust district it's part of the sawdust district and that got us two additional liquor licenses. yeah but yeah. wasn't there some other uh, there's the new opportunity zone yeah. that have been created by the Department of Treasury and frankly I don't know the details well enough to tell you how well that's going to work on the investments it's a it's a tax a capital gains tax deferral and tax abatement program and uh, the rules haven't come out yet on that okay but that so is this, this project probably wouldn't well we don't know yet I don't know yet okay it could so we don't know if they'll be coming to the city for assistance or have they talked to us about any assistance at this point in time they are not asking for any city assistance okay, okay. thank you deputy mayor palmeri yes thank you uh, mayor so mr davis um it looks like uh, bridgeview holdings is who's listed as the applicant on this is that somebody local uh yes i believe bridgeview holdings uh has property over uh, near uh, the Community Foundation, if I recall, that on Ohio. oracular on Ohio oracular. is what I remember. Uh, well, it's good to see that we have local folks working on this as well. Yes. Thank you. 
Councilperson Herman. Thank you. Uh, this is for Ms. Snell. It's resolution 18-283. Thank you. We're approving this special event to a person, Mr. Sashek, to use out our house square, but it's for Frankie Joe inspirational celebration. What is that? So Frankie Joe is his daughter, and she does um, she does music in the park on Saturdays, okay. um, and utilizes that space. They sent in as a special event because they're utilizing ex or requesting exclusive use of that area on those certain dates okay because there's just nothing in the memo that really explained what Frankie Joe inspirational is so sure. okay that takes care of it for me thank you Deputy Mayor Palmieri just a follow-up question then um, <clears throat> so with that being a series of Saturdays and only a portion of the area are, is the Opera House Square also still available for other events on those dates as well it certainly could be. We would work with individuals, whoever was asking for the, for that. Um, I believe two years ago we had a yoga group and them on the same day kind of working together and, and doing that at different times. Sure. Um, but yeah, we kind of worked together with the organizers to see what fits in that space, what wouldn't. Obviously, the yoga, they didn't want to do it at the same time that she was singing, so they came in a little bit later or earlier in the day versus her 1 o'clock. Yeah, thanks for the map. It looked like the green space was still open, that this was just at the sundial kind of paved area. Correct. Thank you. I see no other council member wishing to uh, ask any questions on the consent agenda, so would you please take the roll? Herman? Aye. Allison Osby? Aye. Paul Mary? Aye. Mugrower? Aye. Prosey? Aye. Peck? Aye. Cummings? Aye. Carried seven. There are no items removed from the consent agenda, so we'll move on to pending ordinances. The first is Ordinance 18-295, approve zone change from suburban mixed use in parens SMU close parens to suburban mixed mixed use district with planned development overlay in parens SMU dash PD close parens 2308 Jackson Street 2316 Jackson Street 23. 24 Jackson Street in Prince Plan Commission recommends approval. Pam, did anyone register to speak to this? No one is registered. I'll bring it back to the council for a motion and a second. So moved. Second. Discussion? Uh, I did ask that we show uh, a rendering again of this development on Jackson Street at this meeting so people knew what we're talking about. This is the Casey's. Proposed uh, gas station. Scott? <coughs> okay, the top is the, the the elevation facing Jackson, and the rear elevation is face is obviously the east, the east side of the building. Okay, if there's no one from the public that would like to speak to this, we have a, do we have a motion and a second already? Mm -hmm. Is there any further discussion? Would you please take the roll? Herman? Aye. Allison Osby? Aye. Paul Mary? Aye. Mugrower? Aye. Crowsey? Aye. Peck? Aye. Cummings? Aye. Grade 7. Next is Ordinance 18-296, Consolidation of Grand Opera House Advisory Board and Landmarks Commission. Did anyone register to speak to this resolution? No one is registered. Bring it back to the council for a motion and a second. So moved. Second. second. Discussion? Would you please take the roll? Herman? Aye. Allison Osby? Aye. Paul Mary? Aye. Ugrower? Aye. Crowsey? Aye. Peck? Aye. Cummings? Aye. Carried seven. Next, we have four new ordinances, one of which will, there'll be no vote on. The first is Ordinance 18-297, prohibit left turns from Jackson Street onto New York Avenue between the hours of 3 p.m. to 7 p.m. Monday through Friday. Pam, we had a yes, uh, speaker. We have, 
Bonnie Cook, 1901 Grove Street, apartment number four. Uh, council members, I am your crossing guard on Jackson in New York. I've been following your articles in the little newspaper that we've been getting. I see your ordinance for the no left turn is from 3 to 7. So that means it's not going to be enforced before 3? That's correct. I have elementary kids that come through from quarter to three till three o'clock, so that doesn't include them for. I got other few other ideas. Um, we go to Green Bay quite a bit. Um, how about the right hand turns that from the people that uh, come up New York from the school? and make a right hand turn. It's not so prevalent in the morning because I'm crossing the kids from that side of Jackson to the school. But in the afternoon, I'm out halfway in that road in the middle of that intersection and the minute those kids get as far as I am in the intersection, those people that want to turn right turns, they just keep right on going. I got two hands sometimes if I catch them out of the corner of my eye, I have my staff sign up, I'll, t I'll yell at them and make them stop. I get a lot of verbal abuse out on that corner, but that don't bother me because they don't intimidate me. I'm a tough old cookie. <laughs> um, two weeks ago when you had the last council meeting, a gentleman came to me on my corner while I was crossing kids. He stayed with me quite a bit. He was asking me about the signs that are like a block and a half down on Jackson both ways. Those work great in the winter time because it's dark in the morning and you can see them. But in the daylight saving time, when I come down Jackson to go to my corner, it doesn't make me look up because you don't hardly see those little flashing lights. Um, this morning I was lucky enough to have uh, second eyes on my corner. The officer sat on Saratoga and Jackson. Traffic was just fine, nice and slow. But if that officer gets called off or they have to go off for some reason, it's right back to the speeding game. They don't pay attention. So how are we going to prevent and make my corner a little bit safer for right hand turns is I'd like for you guys to think about some of these. Um, another thing I had a suggestion for is how about getting some cheaper GoPro cameras and having some of us crossing guards wear those and have those on and because it's kind of hard to check and get license plate numbers for those people that are that ignorant when you're crossing the kids across the street. Um, we frequent Green Bay a bit because that's where my youngest son lives. And most of their intersections for their school crossings I can provide a picture the next time I go up there. I can take a picture and bring it back. But they have wires coming from all four corners. And in the middle of the intersection is this big old yellow flashing light and it flashes all four ways. And you cannot miss those. So that's something that maybe you could think about too. That's all I need to say. I've just been following your articles and it's like, okay, I want to make that corner as safe as we can. Okay? Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Have a good evening. Uh, I need to, if no one else wants to speak, I'd like to bring it back to council for a motion and a no, second. There's no First movement. No, nothing, oh, that's right. no action. Then we have two weeks. I would suggest that Jim Collins get with this lady and um, have a meeting with her. She seems to know that corner very well, and it, it has been a problem for 
years and years, especially the speeding on Jackson. But Deputy Mayor Palmieri. Well, she already left. I just wanted to thank her for being out there in the cold and uh, dealing with some of those unfortunate folks that aren't so supportive. Um, I drive up that way quite a bit, and um, she's there faithfully. Councilmember Allison Osby. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, so I guess my question would be back to city staff. I mean, in taking a look, um, as she mentioned, she has children crossing at 245. So is that something that maybe we can reevaluate the times that we have in there? We can take a look at it. The purpose of the, the new restrictions were about uh, crashes at the turns. It was not specifically about the school, although we knew the benefit would be there. But I've jotted it down about the 245 thing. Uh, and I'll, I'll talk to Mr. Collins about it. This was more about, in fact, staff had originally looked at four to six, but the um, traffic, review, uh, traffic Review Board recommended three, uh, three to seven, as it's shown here. Right, so but I'm just We've already it. expanded it, so I think people would be open to expand it based on, based on this. So probably the thing to do is let us come back, and uh, if council feels the, the, the benefit of expanding that, just pick another, uh, just expand it. I'd probably do it by a half hour. I wouldn't do it by a 15 minute right. just to help it, but we can certainly take a look at some of the things that, that Bonnie talked about. Bonnie's an employee, so you know perhaps uh, she's maybe talked to the police department about this, but I'll find out about that as well. I wish we had a few more of Bonnie's around town. <laughs> <laughs> you knew where she stood, that's yeah, for sure. Yeah, you knew exactly where she stood. <laughs> Councilman Crozzi. Thank you, Mayor. Um, my thoughts too we needed to push it back to 2:30. i mean the crossing guards are there for the elementary students for the most part they're the ones that are at most risk and i just had a question was there a study done in the morning for the kids walking to school too would that be a possibility to have yeah, the time i believe the it was looked at but i uh, i can't remember what uh, it may have been council member um pansky who was on the traffic review board so uh we don't have councilor uh, council member to Give some perspective from the traffic review advisory board. It was looked at, but it's really about the it's about the crashes and the crash data didn't support it in the morning. But if it's about if we want to expand it to talk about the schools, I don't know if necessarily the left turns are going to result in higher traffic I mean, or safer moves because you heard Bonnie say she'd like to figure out something with the right turns as well. Well, we got to have some turns, so we have to we have to look at that. So. Uh, if you could indulge us, let us take a look at this from the school perspective. I know Jim was going to reach out to the mayoral uh, leadership to get some perspective from them, and I, I'm not sure if mayoral had chimed in yet, and I certainly want to check that out as well. Councilman Herman. Thank you, Mayor. Yeah, I don't think this ordinance is very well thought out at all. Um, having been on the traffic review board, speeds have been a problem in this area. I actually think two things should happen possibly one we have the flashing signs she mentioned it on both ends of the school area I think we should reduce the speed limit in that area at all times during the school hours I know it's supposed to be down when the kids are in the area but I don't think that makes a big difference I also think that this is going to confuse a lot of citizens this is a major thoroughfare in through the city and who's going to pay attention to science that you can't turn left at three o'clock are we putting it no arrow sign up there like we did on Church and Main to try to prevent people turning left on the Main Street? Or are we just going to put signage up there that says no left turn? Who's going to pay attention to that when they're going 35, 40 miles an hour down the street and all they want to turn? So um, I think accidents is the, is the reason for this one. So then maybe if we think the timeline is, say, 3 to 7 or 2 to 7 or whatever, why don't we have a designated left arrow turn and then it's turned off? during the times you can't turn. You know, like some or others where you get, the cars get the turn first. Because it's accidents, it's, it's the same issue we had on Murdoch to why we went to traffic calming and, and that was because of the accidents of the car in the right lane, the person in the left lane doesn't see the second lane. So it's the same issue here as we have in Murdoch and yet this is a major thoroughfare to the courthouse, to the public safety building, to downtown. So. I, to me, this is a hodgepodge, and I, I won't support it if it comes back in any fashion like this without looking at um, signage has got to be something different than just putting up some signs a block away that says no left turn at three three to seven. That just 
citizens aren't going to pay attention to that. And you're, it's going to be an enforcement, you know, for law enforcement, they're going to have to, what, wait for an accident? Or are they going to sit there and say, okay, that car turned at 3.30, left, I guess I can write them a ticket for failure to obey a traffic signal? Courts are going to have some issues with those kind of law rules. When they're special, specific like that, having gone, been in traffic court many, many times, the courts struggle with those types of things because it's an educational thing more than anything. Yeah. So I think it needs to be really looked at and taken back to the traffic review board. Yeah. If the council wants to take a look at larger issues than just the left turn associated with crashes, my suggestion would be to refer it back to traffic review because I don't think all those issues that you're asking about could get done in two weeks. Right. Because this is the first we heard to... about it, too. Was it? Yeah, and I got no feedback so. from anybody on this. We had talked about it, and to me, the missing link was more about Merrill School, and we, we hadn't gotten any feedback from them. And so maybe if, if council would like us to take <clears> a, a broader look at this rather than just the crash data, uh, maybe the appropriate motion would be just to refer back to traffic for you and then don't waste your time about doing it next week we'll get it we'll get started on it right away I'll I'll make that motion to refer ordinance 18-297 back to traffic <coughs> review board for further analysis I'll is there second. a second discussion uh, wait, wait. Just, we've got a whole bunch of names here uh, okay. let's, let's kind of play about the rules you guys wanted um, my feeling is that this, the kids come first, and, and and there's a lot of after school activities, kids walking to and from the school. So I think you're right. We've got to look at it as the whole issue. Jackson is a nightmare. Just talk to the, any of the residents, such as Shirley, who was here before. That um, it's look, it's an expressway. Um, the neighbors have put up signs on their own to tell people to slow down, which are not, I don't think, well heated. So. Um, <coughs> It, it really needs to be looked at much carefully. And again, the students come first. You know, crashes are not nice, but the kids come first. Deputy Mayor Palmieri. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I believe that last year I received a binder about two inches thick uh, from some folks in that area who were suggesting um, a road diet and or parking um, restructuring or reformatting uh, for the purposes of trying to shape the behavior and I believe that this flashing light was kind of a compromise so I would agree that um, in referring it back to uh, traffic review that you know perhaps that more comprehensive look at this and not just the specific with the school would be appropriate especially in light of the fact that that neighborhood association did so much work on this that raises a larger issue because uh, several years ago, this actually predates me, so it goes back over 10 years. Uh, residents in that area had asked about, for lack of a better term, the common term now is road diet. It probably wasn't the term 10 years ago, but it, uh, that has a lot to do with the state because that's a state highway, mm -hmm. and there are restrictions on what we can do in terms of restricting that. The volume of traffic on that section of road is much different than, for example, Murdoch or something like that. I can ask staff to re take a look at it, but that's, you're going even one deeper than that, which I don't think the traffic has reduced itself uh, in the past 10 years. If anything, uh, four lanes uh, is, a, is a challenge to do that right now, which I think is part of the reason this came about, because the left turns are a challenge with that much traffic going on we we don't have room for a dedicated left turn lane which you know I, I, ideally more would be valuable rather than less but we can take a look at uh, the long the larger issue I'm not sure who's going to be the council member who is getting uh, who was bestowed the traffic review advisory board but that might be something that you may want to sit down with mr. Collins and get a little background on that so you can uh, uh, get a flavor for for the the depth of this issue. Looks Council like Member oh, No, I'll, I'll defer to Council Member Palmieri. I think she's still got a few more comments. No, I just saw Mr. Davis coming up and it looked like he had something he'd like to share, but you guys do get out. Who's Feel going free. first? Go ahead. I was just going to mention that staff has been talking about uh, the corridor plans that we've done in the city, and Jackson is one of those corridors that we have not done a plan for yet. Uh, so we've been looking at different alternatives and scopes for 
uh, a corridor study similar to the 9th and Oshkosh Ave where there'd be a, tra a combination traffic study and some other improvements that could improve that entire corridor in this neighborhood as well as the area north of Murdoch. So just wanted to put that on your radar screen. Is that something that we think is uh, important for that entire corridor? So that could be rolled into this. Councilman Peck. Mr. Mugerauer, was have you addressed your issues? I appreciate it. Um, just a, a quick thing. I have to agree with Council Member uh, Herman on this one. The, um, this, the intention of this is, is really the accents, and, and I do um, completely support that. We've got to make it safe for the students, but the accents is the real part of this, or at least this, this ordinance change, and um, this one's going to create more confusion than I think it's going to fix. The speeding um, and the speed structure on that street is a real culprit in those accidents, and so when it goes back to traffic review, um, I think the speed is what will drive uh, lowering those accidents in that intersection. Mm -hmm. Mr. Peck? Uh, thank you. Just a point of order. Uh, it is designated on the uh, agenda that there will be no formal action taken on this item at this meeting. And while I do support laying this over or, or referring it back, that is deemed a formal action. Do we need to basically waive the rule and then to pass it on first reading and then make the motion to refer I don't just that it's a point of order the, it's, yeah, it's conferring it's, with the clerk we haven't typically done that we yeah. the notation of no formal action is just what the clerk anticipates it's her note you would always have the opportunity to waive the rules um, yeah, we, yeah, for, for a referral with, back, I don't think we need to. Yeah. Yeah. Ordinances require two readings to, before they're passed, so I think the idea is that it's letting people know there'll still be another opportunity to comment on this yeah. at a future meeting. Um, given the feedback we're getting from council, this should go back to the committee, and we should we shouldn't waste two weeks to get it back. We ought to send it back as soon as possible. No, no, I I totally agree, but it is a it is a question of rules of order. I mean, I agree yeah. with, with, with referring it back, but the agenda is it, w there are public records laws that have to be, be met, and I'm, I'm not trying to stop this. I'm just trying to make sure that we're doing everything properly yeah. because there may be someone who supports this who, if we refer it back, can then come and say, you guys didn't do this the right way, therefore it... I don't believe there's a problem because the intent of that is about two readings. It's not about... It's, it's about moving it forward rather than moving it back. The council wants to move it back. That's an, that's an appropriate action that I don't think uh, goes against the, the Again, the, the, the notation here. is really just a, a note from the clerk's office that there's no formal action anticipated. It's not really a rule of the council that needs to be waived in this case, I would say. But we did have a motion and a second. Did we have to reverse those? Or we just move on? I'm comfortable moving on. To the vote to, to refer vote, back. Yes. All right. I just yeah. just wanted to ask the question. Thank you. Um, thank you. Next, we have Ordinance 18. No, we no, have no, to, we need to vote take on that. We still have to <coughs> move it back to, <coughs> to referring it back. Oh, okay. We have a motion and a second. We've had discussion. Would you please take the roll? Herman? Aye. Allison Osby? Aye. Paul Mary? Aye. Mugrower? Aye. Crosey? Aye. Pack? Aye. Cummings? Aye. Carried seven. Moving on to Ordinance 18 298, approve extending the closure of intersection of West South Park Avenue slash Oregon Street. Perrin staff recommends waiving the rules and adopting on first reading. Did anyone register to speak to this? No one is registered. I'll bring it back to the council for a motion and a second. To suspend. To suspend. I would Mr. move Peck. to I would move to suspend the rules to uh, adopt this on the first reading. Second. To waive the rules. Excuse me. Discussion. Would you please take the roll? Herman. Aye. Allison Osby. Aye. Paul Mary. Aye. 
Mugerauer? Aye. Krause? Aye. Peck? Aye. Cummings? Aye. Carried seven. Now we go to or ordinance 18-298, approve extending the closure of intersection of West South Park Avenue, Oregon Street. So moved. Second. Are you seconding it? Are no, you asking? I, he's asking for a second. Oh, I'm, second. Asking, I'm asking for a second. <laughs> and now discussion. And now please take the vote. Herman? Aye. Allison Osby? Aye. Paul Mary? Aye. Mugerauer? Aye. Krause? Aye. Peck? Aye. Cummings? Aye. Carried seven. Ordinance 18-299, repeal and rec recreate section 17-36 in parens F, close parens, parens 1, close parens, regarding inspection service fees for public nuisance affecting property usage. Staff recommends waiving the rules and adopting a first reading. Pam, did anyone, re anyone register to speak to this? No one is registered. Right. I would move to waive the rules and adopt on first reading. Second. Discussion? Would you please take the roll? Herman? Aye. Allison Osby? Aye. Paul Mary? Aye. Mugrower? Aye. Crosby? <coughs> Aye. Peck? Aye. Cummings? Aye. Carried seven. This is Ordinance 18 299. Moved. Second. Discussion? Would you please take the vote? Herman? Aye. Allison Osby? Aye. Paul Mary? Aye. Mugrower? Aye. Crosby? Aye. Pack? Aye. Cummings? Aye. Carried seven. Now we'll move on to 18, Ordinance 18 300. Amend membership of Rental Housing Advisory Board. Staff recommends waiving the rules and adopting on first reading. Did anyone sign up to speak to this? No one is registered. Move to waive the rules and adopt on first reading. Second. Discussion? Would you please take the roll? Herman? Aye. Allison Osby? Aye. Paul Mary? Aye. Mugerower? Aye. Crosby? Aye. Peck? Aye. Cummings? Aye. Carried seven. Back to Ordinance 18-300, amend membership of Rental Housing, Housing Advisory Board. Moved. Second. Discussion? Council Member Herman. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I don't, it's, uh, City Attorney Lawrence, can you just explain to the community what, why we're amending the membership of the Rental Housing Advisory Board? It might affect some of our rental property owners or whoever can yeah. address it. This was actually brought forward by uh, Mayor Cummings. Uh, so I, I guess that's why the staff didn't have a memo. So I guess I'd defer to the mayor to talk about the membership and the desire uh, of the membership. Uh, when we first did the ordinance, we failed to uh, firstly uh, have a city council representative serve on the board. This is to kind of you know, to clean this up that there will be a council representative on the board. Okay. We thought you were. That, that was kind of an I error thought I was too. Yeah, that was an error <laughs> on our part. Okay. Council member, or Deputy Mayor Palmieri. Yes, um, just a question then, Mayor. Um, did we remove the board makeup language that we had in there <coughs> separate and distinct from the council representative? That's why the, yeah. that's why the that's right. ordinance before you is the, worded the way it is. It now makes it clear that there's seven and one of those is a council. It changes member. the first unnumbered paragraph. It does not change the second, the second. unnumbered okay. paragraph. Very good, thank you. If there's no further discussion, would you please take the roll? Herman? Aye. Allison Osby? Aye. Paul Mary? Aye. Mugrower? Aye. Crosby? Aye. Pack? Aye. Cummings? Aye. Carried seven. Next, we have a number of new resolutions. The first is Resolution 18 301, approve special event of Verve Credit Union to host Flicks in the Sticks at Family Video, June 9, 2018. Did anyone? Register to speak to this. No one is registered. I'll bring it back to the council for a motion and a second. So moved. Second. Discussion? Would you please take the roll? Herman? Aye. Allison Osby? Aye. Paul Mary? Aye. Mugrower? Aye. Crosby? Aye. Pack? Aye. 
Cummings? Aye. Carried seven. Resolution 18-302, approve annual city licenses in parents renewals, close parents. Pam, did anyone register to speak to this? No one is registered. Bring it back to the council for a motion and a second. So moved. Second. Discussion? Would you please take the roll? Herman? Aye. Allison Osby? Aye. Paul Mary? Aye. Mugerower? Aye. Crowsey? Aye. Peck? Aye. Cummings? Aye. Carried seven. Next is resolution 18-303, approve combination Class B license, the nominee nation arena. Pam, did anyone register to speak to this? No one is registered. Bring it back to the council for a motion and a second. So moved. Second. Discussion? Council Member Allison Osby. Thank you. For obvious reasons, I will be uh, voting present. Okay, thank you. I see no one uh, wishing to discuss this any further, so I will ask for a motion and a second. We have one. Also, oh, someone will take the roll. Okay, we're good. Herman? Aye. Allison Osby? Present. Paul Mary? Aye. Mugerower? Aye. Crowsey? Aye. Peck? Aye. Cummings? Aye. Carried 6 1 present. Next resolution 18 304 approved transfer of combination Class B license dash H2 oil in Perens Robbins Restaurant. Perens staff recommends denial due to inactivity. Is anyone registered to address this issue? No one is registered. I'll bring it back to the council for a motion and a second. I would move. Second. Discussion? Councilman Herman. Just a point of clarification. A yes vote means we approve the license, a no vote means we don't approve it, correct? Correct. Its okay. staff is recommending a no, vote. No, no, vote. no vote. Okay, just making clarification so that everybody's on the same page. Thank you. Thank you. Deputy Mayor Palmieri. Okay, so if this is a transfer, we would be voting against the transfer. Correct. Correct. As we've discussed previously, it would, we want to start bringing back inactive licenses. So if someone does have a need, we have them. For an yeah. and Mr. Mayor, if I could, just, I think the logic behind staff's recommendation is that approving the transfer would almost signal to that person that the inactivity is still going to be allowed and we're still going to have to deal with the inactivity. That's the reason that we're suggesting not to transfer it. And I believe Ms. Huber contacted Mr. Hoopman to let him know what was going on. I don't know if he necessarily liked it, but he understood it. Yes, I communicated with him last Thursday. Councilman Peck. Uh, I'm good with the answer that we just heard. Okay. I see no other council member wishing to discuss this resolution, so would you please take the roll? Herman? No. Allison Osby? No. Paul Mary? No. Mugrower? No. Crowsey? No. Peck? No. Cummings? No. Lost 07. Next is resolution 18-305, approve amending code enforcement service fees and create sump pump just discharge only enforcement, enforcement service fees. Pam? No one is registered. I'll bring it back to the council for a motion and a second. So moved. Discussion? Second. 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 I need a second. Second. Now discussion. Councilman Peck. Uh, direct this to Mr. Roloff. This is another issue. This is another, or Mr. Davis. Uh, this is another issue where basically the state is allowing local control. Correct? Well, we have, we are Sorry. allowed local control, yes. No, there, 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 was, there was sarcasm, oh, okay. I unfortunately. Didn't, I didn't see the air quotes. Uh, <laughs> there are certain parameters that we have to use if we're going to charge a service fee, and that's why Act 317 required that, so we're responding in kind. So the state is basically telling us how to operate the city of Oshkosh. Uh, that is correct. We cannot charge for the first notice, or first uh, violation and inspection. It's really nice of them. I don't think I have to say any more. It's, uh, <laughs> I think you expressed our feelings quite nicely about Madison. Uh, Councilmember Herman. Yeah, just um, because it specifically talks about sump pump discharge, I know we've 
amended this ordinance, I think last fall we made some changes where you can't have your discharge go over the sidewalk and go into the street and it can't go on the, or on the sidewalk. So you want to just explain a little bit because it, it specifically talks about some pumps. So if you want to just kind of reiterate it sure. for people out there uh, so they're aware of what's going on. Unfortunately, the density of development in Oshkosh uh, doesn't allow a whole lot of space for sump pumps uh, and their discharge. And in some cases, uh, property owners uh, end up discharging their sump pump waste, uh, discharge the water that comes out of the sump pump into the public right of way, oftentimes on the sidewalk. Uh, that creates a hazard for the public, especially in the spring and fall when it could potentially freeze. Uh, and we get those calls. The plumbing inspector will go out. He'll try to educate the, uh, the property owner or the tenant, or the, as the case may be, and explain what they need to do to comply with the code. And okay. the first uh, inspection and violation will also, uh, we hadn't charged a, a fee is what I remember, and uh, now we are formalizing that in conjunction with Act 317 because that's, uh, again, a property maintenance uh, issue. Okay, thank you. Uh, would you please take the roll? Herman? Aye. Allison Osby? Aye. Paul Mary? Aye. Mugrower? Aye. Crozy? Aye. Pack? Aye. Cummings? Aye. Carried seven. Resolution 18-306 approves specific implementation plan for construction of a Casey's General Store 2322 Jackson Street in Perrins Plan Commission recommends approval. Is anyone, has anyone signed up for this? No one is registered. Bring it back to the council for a motion and a second. So moved. Second. Discussion. Deputy Mayor Palmieri. Uh Yes, thank you, Mayor. Um, Mr. Davis, uh, it looks like I believe this is the one where there were some residents who were concerned um, at Smith. Is that correct? Am I on the right one? Smith yes. Or Smith or Bacon. Yes, that they were concerned about some of the access points in the driveways um, coming from the north side, I believe, on Smith Avenue. Uh, yes, that's the, well, it's the north side of Smith, but it's a south entrance to the Casey's development. They also have an access on Jackson. Uh, and I believe Mr. Herman was concerned about that at a previous meeting as well. Uh, based on what we saw for the traffic movements, we didn't see that being a, 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 a significant uh, safety issue. Uh, so we were, we were proposing to uh, recommend approval as it was presented. Thank you. I see no other council member wishing to ask any questions or discuss discuss this further. So, would you please take the roll? Herman. Aye. Allison Osby. Aye. Paul Mary. Aye. Mugrower. Aye. Crozy. Aye. Pack. Aye. Cummings. Aye. Carried seven. Resolution 18-307 approved variance request for sidewalk cafe by the Granary, 50 West Sixth Avenue to permit sidewalk cafe tables and benches to be securely stored outside overnight in print staff recommends approval. Pam, did anyone register to speak to this? No one is registered. Okay, I'll bring it back to the council for a motion and a second. So moved. Second. Discussion? I see no one uh, wishing to discuss it, so uh, would you please take the roll? Herman? Aye. Allison Osby? Aye. Paul Mary? Aye. Mugrower? Aye. Rosie? Aye. Pack? Aye. Cummings? Aye. Carried seven. Resolution 18-308, approved access agreement for Oshkosh Corporation Global Headquarters construction, Kohler and Pinocchio Streets. Pam, has anyone signed up? No one is registered. Bring it back to the council for a motion and a second. So moved. Second. Discussion. <coughs> Would you please take the roll? Herman? Aye. Allison Osby? Aye. Paul Mary? Aye. <coughs> Grower? Aye. Rosie? Present. Pack? Aye. Cummings? Aye. Carried six, one present. Next, we have council discussion, direction of the city manager and future agenda items. 
the first future agenda item is Act 13, Rental Inspection. Uh, we need a date and a time to be determined. Staff still working on it. We'll okay. get back after June 1st. Direction for revocation for Brass Rail and Match Matches Bar. It's just a reminder to the council, based on the direction that you've been consistently giving us, uh, these two are due for their year of inactivity notice, and so the city clerk will be putting that out there, and given the fact that it's towards the end of the permitting year, we'll be bringing these back for non-renewal and or revocation, depending on, these it's more like these will be revocations because of inactivity. Okay. So we'll be bringing these back likely on the June 12th meeting. Uh, similarly, just uh, we had pulled at the last minute. Morgan District was due to be here tonight, but the, uh, they informed us that they were going to be out of town today. So out of courtesy, we held that one over. You'll also see that one on June 12th as well. And we have future workshops coming up. The first is a workshop tomorrow evening, which is May 23rd at 6 o'clock. The Oshkosh Area School Board will be meeting at the Oshkosh Area School District Administration Building at 215 South Eagle Street. Can everyone make that meeting? Right. Uh, next is a st our strategic planning workshops. The first is June 21st. Mayor, just one. Yep. I had buzzed in. Uh, the June 21st, I'll probably be leaving at 2 o'clock as I have a commitment at 2.30. Okay, so we've got Thank the you. June 30th, 20, 21st date and July 19th date. These are day-long sessions from 8 until 4.30 in the afternoon, and the location is at TB, TBD. Uh, Council Person Allison Osby. Thank you, Mayor, and I mentioned this a couple weeks ago, right. but just as a reminder, um, I am out of state uh, on June 21st. All right, thank you. And then our first budget workshop is on July 25th at 5 p.m. 5 p.m. in room 404. And on July 31, we have a council workshop on our public works contracts beginning at 5 o'clock in room 404. Now is, our, is the second opportunity to citizens make statements to council. Pam, did anyone register? No one is registered. Okay, thank you. Uh, there are no council members making, wishing to make any announcements or statements, so at this point I'll turn it over to City, City Manager Roloff. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, in your agenda packet, you have the, uh, the final revenue expense statements for 2017. Uh, happy to report that we're slightly, slightly over on revenues and slightly under on expenditures. That's going to give us about roughly a half million dollars return to the general fund increase in our fund balance which is always good news. Um, so uh, we'll be getting the audit probably towards uh, the end of July, and that'll uh, be the topic of one of your uh, budget workshops with that. So we're happy to report that. Um, Ms. Larson has also provided the 2018 first quarter revenue expense statements. Those don't take quite as long as the fourth quarter, so you're getting those at the same time. Um, the other item I want to point out to you is the the budget preparation calendar, uh, the mayor's already identified a couple of those, those workshops and uh, get things kicked off. Um, but you'll notice the calendar pretty much follows the same schedule with one exception, and I just want to uh, draw this to your attention. Um, as we were looking at some of the schedules, uh, getting the budget approved sooner rather than later is going to be very important this year. Uh, and so what we're proposing is that the budget hearing at which we get few, if any, comments, but the budget hearing and the budget adoption happen at the same meeting. So we're proposing that the budget get adopted on November 13th rather than what under normal circumstances you would have seen it on November 27th, uh, but we're suggesting get it earlier. You're still going to get the budget uh, with uh, the same amount of time. You'll still have a whole month to have your budget workshops and things like that. It's just that uh, given the fact that the uh, with the new budgeting system and the new uh, and getting the tax bills out, which is obviously the, the most important thing. Uh, Ms. Larson felt it was appropriate to have the budget hearing and the budget adoption on the same date. Other than that, the calendar pretty much holds to what council has seen in the past. Councilman Herman has a question. Yes, I do. Is October 19th correct? That's a Friday. 
that is what is proposed uh, given the the limited uh, between the leak conference and and other conflicts with uh, with that uh, the fifth that the, all day one, right? that that's an all-day one so that's being proposed for Friday um, thank you for pointing that out during that's, the day you're talking about during the day that would be an all-day one though those are typically all day we've done them uh, there's also the the 29th and 30th of October, but I believe there's some conflict with that, although that's the fifth Tuesday. So um, it's really up to council. Uh, the idea is to get the draft out here for you to take a look at. Um, I thank you for pointing that one out because I, I thought that would also be a challenge. Excuse me for not bringing yeah. that up. And then also just to make a note of it, September 19th, I will not be at that uh, CIP workshop, but I plan on attending the CIP review at the Planning Commission so that I get that information that night versus what that Wednesday. I have a prior commitment. September 19th, correct? That's correct. I will not be at that one. Good. Thank you. Councilman Peck, you have a question. Uh, two things. The 19th and 22nd of October, I will be out of town that particular weekend. Uh, and then related to the budget hearing, I, I do know that, as Mr. Roloff indicated, that it's sparsely attended. Um, would it be possible to schedule that? So to give the citizens some time to, you know, rather than just come and speak to it and then we act on it, is there any way that we could move that to some time during the, uh, you know, possibly on the, to the 8th of, of November or something? I'll have to check on that. There's a time. From the time we present the budget to the council on October 9th, that's the earliest we could post the notice that says our budget's available for public review. That's the real kicker. Um, let me take a look at that as well as, uh, you know, already one council member said they wouldn't be available on the 19th or 22nd. Council member Herman pointed out Fridays, uh, you know, a little iffy on the Friday. So let's take a look at those things and maybe bring this back the whole idea is to get it out there, get you thinking about it. So I appreciate the feedback. Um, and we'll take a look at those things and see if we can maybe take a look at another, uh, for lack of a better term, you know, cooling off period between the hearing and the council taking action. We'll take a look at those things. But it, has, it all has to do with when we get the notices out so that we follow the uh, state law in terms of giving people plenty of time to review the budget. The, uh, the budget that is posted is the proposed budget, not all the amendments that council makes. So we don't have to wait until the council workshops. We just have to make sure that we staff have some, have already presented you with something so that there's something on the table for the for the public to comment on. So I'll take a look at that. And how about if I just bring this back uh, for the next meeting as well? Okay. Thank you. Is that good? Thank you. Appreciate the feedback. Um, Transload bus facility ribbon cutting uh, June 13th at 3 p.m. at the Transload facility in the Southwest Industrial Park. Uh, that's the date and time we have. Although Mr. Fitzpatrick attended a meeting on my, my behalf yesterday, there may be a conflict, and I'm not sure, Mr. Davis, if we can move that around. But regardless of anything, I would encourage you to keep that date and time reserved because there'll be one and perhaps two things that you might be invited to that time. Uh, the transload facility is something that we've been working on for approximately seven years and this all goes back to Allerton Drive if we want to remember that. Um, so it, it's very important and what that's become is, is it's just outstanding. Uh, but there's some other conflicts with WEDC is going to be in town for something else that same day unrelated to transload. I'd love to have them go to both things but you can't do it when they're competing on time. So we'll get that back to you and, and let you know. Um, so, but that afternoon, that time is going to be committed to something or another. So, um, hopefully, if you could set some time aside, that'd be great. Um, Oshkosh Corp. The idea is to close on the property on Friday. Uh, it seems to be where the, everything's in motion for for that to happen, uh, and uh, we're continuing to do the uh, archaeological analysis. And we've come up with other things, but nothing that's prevented the project project from proceeding. It's just that uh, we're required to follow all the state rules uh, with the State Historical Society as well as uh, the DNR. Uh, temporary closure of the Lakeshore site. There were some questions that were raised and so 
uh, I mentioned it to in passing to a couple council members and they said would you just make sure you bring this up um, we have uh, temporarily closed uh, the site primarily because of everything that's been going on there as of late and, and I asked mr. Mauer to come and just explain a little bit about what exactly we've done because the parks director has the authority to close the park if there's some type of safety issues and he's exercised that with everything that's been going on um, but maybe as we go forward he can explain that as well thanks mark um, going back to uh, prior just prior to the last snowstorm April 15th this year so um, the week before that when the um, archaeological survey had started we had gotten a few citizens that were um, going out on the site and um, actually getting pretty close to the excavation sites. Uh, the streets department had asked some of the citizens to leave the site. <coughs> Police department was called and some of the citizens were taking video saying we're being kicked out of a public park, et cetera. Um, so we had discussions with the police chief and Alan Davis and his staff and Mr. Roloff and looking at the park rules and regulations, um, the parks director is authorized to temporarily close um, a park or section thereof. Um, what the chief wanted was some enforcement action for his staff, um, something solid in ordinance. So we agreed, um, we worked with our sign division to um, come up with some temporary park close signs. We got the snowstorm, which then delayed work out there, which gave us some time to get the signs made. By the time the snow melted, we had the signs up, um, and I believe that we've had limited um, people out there. Um, from what I've heard and from uh, any complaints we have seen. Um, our intent all along was just keep it temporarily closed, meaning once the archeological survey is done, uh, the public construction things that were going on because we had stormwater engineering out there doing some work in the ponds, um, checking pipe elevations and so forth for the stormwater management that needs to be done on the site. Um, once that work was complete and the site was made safe again for the public, our intent was to take the signs down and let people enjoy the open space um, because I have had citizens say can we go out and walk the cart paths or bike, ride our bikes out there and my response has been yes up until this point um, so our or my intent all along I think with uh, talking with staff was the signs would come down at that point so that's just a little background with with what we've been doing technically it's open uh, there are restrictions that, that exist in our code and if we see other things that are coming up, we're going to exercise our judgment and, and close. You can see that uh, Mr. Maurer doesn't do that in a vacuum. He's consulted with Mr. Davis and Chief Smith and myself. And I, th and I think it, it's the appropriate thing to do just out of, uh, for public safety purposes. Councilmember Herman, you have something to say? Yeah. Um, I don't think it's a good idea to open and close it. Because we're going to close it again when you put the roads in. We're going to close it again. When we're doing some other construction, I, to me, it's closed until all the construction is done. We don't have a plan. Yes, there's a green space that some people could use, get to, and whatever, but I just think for liability purposes with Oshkosh Corp going across our property with heavy equipment and all that kind of stuff, and to close it and then open it for a couple of weeks and then close it again, I think it just makes sense to keep the park closed until the roads are in, the sidewalks are in, Oscar's Corp is in, then we can open it back up until we have a plan in place to make it Lakeshore Park or whatever we're gonna call it and develop it and close it again. So I think, I think again, it's, it's confusing citizens. Is it open, is it not open? Can I go there or can I not go there? Either I can go there or I can't, one or the other. I think it should be the other, close it. That's my opinion. Deputy Mayor Palmieri. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I would agree that obviously for safety reasons, you know, we needed to close that at least temporarily. Um, we did, we do have a significant amount of acreage though that is not in immediate proximity to those sites. And it would appear that, I don't know if we have a map or not, but it would appear that um, I'm looking at our update you know, some of these trails and things like that, some of that construction is not even going to happen until well into 2019. So it would seem that the western, perhaps, I think I have my geography right, uh, section of that could be open for, you know, one to two seasons where no activity is going on and no one would be, and, and perhaps I'm mistaken, but it seems like you've thought this out pretty well and consulted everyone and looks like 
there is an imminent opening where people could enjoy that open space without being uh, creating any kind of safety issues. Is that what you're thinking sometime yet this season? Yes, once um, once Oshkosh Corp begins their construction, um, my understanding, I'm talking to Mr. Davis, is going to be sometime early to mid-June. They're going to be fencing in their entire construction site as well. Um, access roads will be coming in. They'll have access roads they're going to have to remain on. Um, they probably won't be fenced, but it's going to be clearly identified where those access roads would be. So the construction site will actually be fenced in, is my understanding. Councilmember Peck. The question is how would people, to your point, there would be a fair amount of green space, but how are people going to access that green space? There's, if they drive their car, there's no place for them to park. Actually, they can uh, they can park on Rath Lane. They can park uh, <coughs> down from our main golf course maintenance shop in Rainbow Park. Um, there are other options for them to access it. I believe a portion of the parking lot, the existing parking lot, will be available. I don't think the entire parking lot is closed off. Um, so where all the people um, fish there, they'll still be able to fish. Um, but there are opportunities for them to park in a couple other areas. But it might create some issues, though, too, because it, where some of those areas will be, even though the, the construction site will be fenced in, it'll still be very close to where the construction site is, especially if it's in the parking lot of the old of the golf course. Correct? Again, that whole area would be fenced off up to the, essentially up to the riverfront. Okay. All right. Mr. Davis does have a map that he could put on the overhead if that would help counsel. Yeah. Yeah. But just for reference purposes, that'd be a good idea. Yep. It's on. It's on. Yeah, look up, it's good. This piece will be part of the construction site uh, for the short term. Uh, they'll also access uh, through here for uh, non-heavy equipment, as the access agreement indicates. Uh, as time goes by, we will be working on the stormwater improvements through this area and potentially through this area. Uh, those plans have not been determined yet, so I couldn't tell you exactly when uh, things are going to be open and closed for those sections. Too late. <laughs> Forgot about that part. <laughs> well, I guess I look at, you know, I've talked to the owner of two brothers. He already has issues with people parking in his parking lot going to the tribal trail. We got no parking lot for these people other than parking on the street on the edge of the golf course. We're just asking people to park in the quality and parking lot and parking in the parking lot of the restaurant again because we are not providing them adequate places to park if they're going to access the lake in that area and I just I, I don't know I just think it I know people want to access the green space that was what the citizens the two percent that weighed in on it want it but I think we should just wait there's plenty of other opportunities to access the trail along the river and the tribal trail and other areas I, I just think that um, we should leave it my opinion again, leave it closed. Councilmember Ogerauer. Yes, a uh, question for uh, Parks Director Maurer. What's your intention, or can you confirm your intention for keeping that land usable? Basically, are you mowing that grass? Are you using staff time and dollars to keep it um, keep it down so yes. people can use it? And if you're going to keep it there, or keep it at that level, or put that investment and that time into it, then the people should be able to use it as much as possible. We are currently mowing the entire site. Um, after the closing, obviously, with Oshkosh Corp, they'll be responsible for their acreage. Um, so that'll cut down on some of the mowing. Um, but we are working on a plan to um, to make other improvements. Some of the sand traps we're going to have to remove, or those are just going to become weed infested. So we'll most likely remove the sand traps, put topsoil in, and seed those areas. Um, we're actually working on some of that reclamation 
um, a restoration plan at this point, but there is some work that needs to be done, but it's essentially mowing the site at this point. So basically, that, that I guess that, that goes to my comments. If we're going to put the, the dollars into just maintaining it, uh, even just mowing it, that's still dollars and time, then the people should have access to it. And I know there's limited space. Uh, is it Rath Lane? Is it Rath right behind uh, how you access Two Brothers? Yes. Um, you can park on the road there. Yes. Um, there is a small area to access it. If we're going to put time into it, then it should be accessible as much as possible uh, and as safely as possible, of course, too. Even if it means temporary closures or short notices for construction things, um, they should be open. That's all I have to Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, just a little bit of follow up. Um, can you go back to the map a minute? Is that all riprap there on the northwest? Um, side of the peninsula or point is that all riprap I'm just curious whether or not you know that's accessible via kayak or boat or no no that's no, all, no. it's not that's it's all, all tree lined it's all wooded it's kind of swampy I lost a lot of golf balls in there <laughs> so you can get the shag them then it's not riprap until you get pretty much behind where the old clubhouse was right or the night and there's board. no access to the golf course from the tribal trail at this point either without no. walking on down. You have to come all the way down to that mm -hmm. exchange station to where Rath Lane goes into the golf course right there. That's where they're, it's, they're supposed to walk down to, but a lot of people walk through the parking lots because they park in their parking lots to access the trail. And there's a, kind of like a, not a cul-de-sac, but like, a, is that Rath? There at the um, east side is that like a little circle? Like if I remember when yes, I drove that's over there. The existing Rath Lane. I mean, it's not like we're probably going to have masses or critical mass there, but um, I, I agree. If we're if we have that maintained and um, we have um, indicated that this is a park, um, there is. I mean, it's pretty significant when you go out there and put your eyes on it. Um, amount of green space that um, you know I could see somebody wanting to picnic or just enjoy the fact that it is available to them um, during season that's my two cents back in is a roll off uh, thank you uh, after a uh, previous meeting there were some questions about uh, Sometimes we do some follow-up with council through the newsletter or something like that regarding uh, citizen statements to fill you in, but maybe the, the, the public doesn't get to see those things. So there were a couple things brought up at the uh, prior uh, meeting about some uh, statements. One was about a bike rack at Leach Amphitheater. The, the, there is a bike rack at Leach Amphitheater. It's just not at the CP entrance. It's actually at the Court Street entrance, which is a bad time to have a bike rack over at the Court Street entrance because Court Street's pretty inaccessible right now, but once Court Street's done, you'll see that uh, we do have a very uh, a very good bike rack there that Mr. Maurer put in actually last year. Uh, roundabout pedestrian safety is an ongoing issue, and Chief Smith and I and Mr. Collins have discussed, um, you know, I, I get plenty of comments, and I know council members do as well. Uh, I've asked Chief to, to increase enforcement out there uh, because, and I drive at least the Witzel Street on a regular basis, and I see people that ignore pedestrians. I, I, there's no other way to say it. And I know all of you have at different areas. Um, my advice to you is be careful through the intersection because we may need to be doing some enforcement, and I don't want any of you to be the unfortunate <laughs> recipient of a, of a little visit because I think we need to do something, and the residents, uh, from a traffic standpoint, the roundabouts have been great. From a pedestrian standpoint, it is a significant challenge, and I don't think anybody disagrees with that. So we need to get people to be aware of that. We've got the flags out there. I've seen somebody wave a flag like they're at the Indy 500, and they get ignored. That's just inconsiderate. I can't think of any other term. We need to let people know that that's not acceptable. We're trying to do everything we can. And any suggestions you have, I'm absolutely open ears to it because it's, it's a bit of a frustration uh, for staff as well. Uh, I was going back, you have a comment? Or a yeah, and, and it's it related to the roundabouts and, and in general, just traffic laws. It, it's not just about the pedestrians. It's about obeying the laws. And, and I drive the, the, um, the Jackson, I go through the Jackson Street roundabout every day going into work, and I drive down Jackson Street. 
and I'll be going down Jackson Street at 31, 32 miles an hour. Granted, it's 30, but I mean, it's, or it's right around 30, you know, 30, 31. Cars go by me like I'm standing still, and the dirty looks that I get, like, what are you doing going so darn slow? It's a matter of being respectful of your fellow citizens who may not be driving a car. Um, people have a right to be on the road in their bike. Uh, people who are on the bike, they also need to pay attention with what they're doing. They can't be halfway out in the street. Um, and that when you see a citizen in by the crosswalk, you have to yield to that, that, that person that's in the crosswalk. And, <clears throat> you know, my running friends talk about, we talk about it all the time, the inattentiveness of drivers as they go through intersections. When you get to an intersection, you have to, Matt, I think it's you have to stop behind the crosswalk, correct? Not in the crosswalk. <laughs> yeah. A stop sign is not a rolling yield. It's not just bounce the front end and then go. So we all need to do this together, and we all need to be responsible for ourselves and watch out for the other guy. But the, the citizens that drive, you know, if it says 30 miles an hour, that doesn't mean go through it 40 plus miles an hour. Mr. Roloff? I don't think I can top that, so I have nothing else. <laughs> All right, with that, I will look for a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Second. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Adjourned. <laughs>